one Lionel Windsor, a lecturer in New Testament at Moore College in Sydney. This is a recording of a seminar I ran for the student preachers at Moore College Women's Chapel. The seminar is about preaching the pastoral epistles. Some of what I say here is specific to the occasion, but most of it is more generally relevant, so I thought I'd make it available here. I've edited it slightly to remove some of the back and forth discussion, partly because the discussion isn't really audible, and also to respect the privacy of the group. There's an outline available on my website at www.lionelwindsor.net. I trust it's helpful for you. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Isabel. And I'm really glad to be able to come and talk about the pastoral epistles and uh, preaching the pastoral epistles here. It's really, really great and very exciting that you guys have the opportunity to do that over this, uh, this coming year. Um, just to... Uh, to, to say, you know, we're asking, uh, being asked to speak on preaching the pastoral epistles, just to say, well, what are, what are we actually talking about today? Um, and what does preaching mean here? What are we talking about? Um, I I'm, I'm know that you guys are preaching in Women's Chapel this year, and that's, that's the immediate kind of thing. Um, so it's about preaching in Women's Chapel this year. Uh, but I think it's broader as well. So I'm, I'm hoping that it'll be useful, as preaching in Women's Chapel is meant to be anyway, useful for all sorts of other ministries, lifetime ministry, like either upfront or speaking uh, one-to-one or whatever it is, uh, ministries that you're involved in. Um, so it's intended to cover a little bit more than that, but of course, you know, the, the obvious focus and the exercise, it's more of an exercise, the actual, you know, chapel uh, preaching that you'll be doing is going to be um, a, a focus. Um, I would actually like to know, there's going to be a few times when I write some things up on the board, I would actually like to, to know, like, what forms of ministries are you or do you anticipate being involved in um, where you will be, you know, where, where, where proclaiming, speaking, sharing, preaching the pastoral epistles will be something that you might end up doing? I'll, I'll write it up on the board because I'd like to know as we start. Um, that sounds like we've, we've covered a few bases. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I, I suspect... There, there may also be, I mean, at least in, in the kind of ministry that, um, that I'm involved in, and I assume that you'll be involved in, there'll be all sorts of opportunities to use uh, the pastoral epistles in your in, in personal ministry, sort of um, uh, yeah, one-to-one, formal one-to-one, but informal one-to-one. Issues come up um, in, in, in people's lives when you're in ministry, and the pastoral epistles are good to have. Now, this isn't necessarily about all of those things, but um, I, I think that's probably going to come up too. Uh, it certainly does for me. <laughs> um, so yeah, what, what we're looking at today is mainly just talking about the kind of issues that come up in, um, in preaching, in hermeneutics, that is in, in, in interpretation and bringing it across to people, to the, you know, the audience, thinking about the people that you're speaking to. Uh, but we're all also going to look, of course, at the content of the books, but um, not in minute detail. So who's doing third year? Who's, who's third year? Okay, so yeah, you guys will be doing the pastoral epistles in third year in some detail. Uh, in fact, every verse in Greek you'll be covering. So uh, which is an, it's actually it works out really well. It's a reason that we, we want, it's not, a, not the only reason, but a reason we can do the pastoral epistles. We can actually look at every verse in Greek. But that's not what this session's about. <laughs> um, it's about uh, looking at kind of those issues of, of, of audience and hermeneutics. I want to start by saying I think the pastoral epistles are both the easiest and the hardest books of the Bible even to, to preach. Um, so why the easiest? Well, in, in one, some sense they're the easiest because there's a pretty direct application from what you read to uh, church and ministry and pastoral situations. It's just, you know, um, it's not completely direct, but in terms of biblical theology, and there's not as much work you need to do to bridge the distance, say, if you're preaching on um, the, the left-handed Benjamite, you know, Ehud, the left-handed Benjamite. That, that's, that's, you know, you've got to do some biblical theological work to bring his, his stabbing of Eglon, king of Moab, into the current context. Uh, whereas the pastoral epistles are written to a church situation. Uh, they're written uh, to um, people who are living 
in, in the church living between the resurrection and the second coming. It's obviously about Jesus. Uh, you know, it's Jesus Christ is central in, in all three pastoral epistles, and quite obviously. Uh, but the, the people and the kind of applications and what Paul is saying um, are the kind of things that you would say to people like us, even though those people live in a slightly different culture and various other things. In terms of biblical theology, in terms of God's great plans for his world, we're living kind of at the same time and in this very similar situation to the people who are being addressed by the pastoral epistles. Um, so obviously there's some specific first century things that we need to be aware of uh, and that's important and as you're doing the exegesis that's, that's going to be important for you. There's also specific purposes of the letters. Uh, they're not just sort of general handbooks. They're actually you know, addressed to specific situations that you need to be aware of. They do matter. But I, I don't think that's massively significant in a way that changes everything. It's something to be aware of, but it's not like, oh, you know, it's, it's so different or something. It's, um, and I don't think some of this is greatly exaggerated in, in some of the literature that I've been reading and you know, the difference between the, their situation and ours. Um, Yes, there is a difference, you know, and you need to be aware, but it's not, not as huge. So much as well of the pastoral epistles is just directly applicable to life. So even, you know, if you're reading something uh, that Paul is speaking about, about, um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the ministry of glory or, 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 or his own ministry or whatever, that, that's, that's important, it matters. Uh, but in the pastoral epistles, it's kind of directly applicable both to life and to ministry. Um, that's what it's about. And so there's, there's a real sort of straightforward easiness to preaching the pastoral epistles uh, in that sense. And that's true for all three pastoral epistles. Okay, so the easiest and the hardest. <laughs> okay, so why, why do I think it's the hardest? And I think um, di different eras at different times, different parts of the Bible raise different issues for different people. And I think the pastoral epistles raise the kind of issues that people in our world, in our churches, you guys, all of us really, are actually really interested in and really matter um, and actually are, are raised uh, straight away. And, and also that um, in our world, we kind of instinctively kind of react against some of the things that are, that are in the pastoral epistles. So, okay, so you read, um, yeah, there's some, some pretty hard things in the Old Testament. You read about, you know, what looks like genocide and you go, well, that's not good. Okay, but a lot of the other stuff in the Old Testament, while it might be quite difficult, um, you know, food laws, it's not the same kind of gut reaction, I don't like this, you know, as, as you get from things in the pastoral epistles. And that's just because of the world we live in um, and the discourse that we're in. Um, and that's not sort of good or bad. It's just this is this is um, where we where we are. Now, of course, obviously, um, the huge uh, amount of um, work has been done, or the huge amount of words have been written, at least, and, and spoken on one Timothy chapter two verses eleven to fifteen. That's the big one. Um, but it's not the only place. So, uh, of course, sometimes the language or the concepts you just read them and you just go, "What? How can you say that?" They're so, you know. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul says, Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. Uh, okay, so far. If she's brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work, but refused to enrol younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. So I would have the younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, give the adversary no occasion for slander. Okay, so as you're reading that, you, you kind of feel, ooh, you, know, you sort of feel that. And that's because of where, where we kind of are and, and, and live and, and, and who we are, but also, the kind of situations that, that come up in our ministries. You go, but if you say that, then, then you know, like that's got all these implications, et cetera, that we know about and that we're, we're kind of very aware of in our, in our world. Um, so it's actually quite hard. Um, and so what, what, there's that. And there's also, of course, the, the fact that very often now, um, through social media, but also through the universities, um, 
people are trained, sometimes implicitly through the, explicitly through the universities, but often just implicitly, to critique texts. So we, we say, what's wrong with this text? Uh, we, we read somebody on social media, and our first thing is, what's wrong with what they're saying? Why are they a bad person? You know, and that will happen here pretty much straight away. So, so we've got the, the sort of the very black and white thinking that we're just trained to do because of social media and everything else. And you know, you see it in polarization and politics, where you read something and you go, well, okay. The first thing to work out is this a good person or a bad person, and then you go, ah, it's very easy to put this into bad person territory. Um, and so it's hard to preach because you say that even reading the words, let alone trying to say this is good, actually there's an instinctive kind of putting it into bad person uh, territory. Um, this is where uh, at this point, so I've, I've just raised it, this, this is how I'm feeling, you know, but I want to, I actually, you know, again, quite genuinely want your input so, um, in, in this. I, it's really helpful for me because I think you guys are really well placed being um, in um, the... The, the, the milieu that you're in, I'm a, I'm a bit older, so you know I've I've you know listened to ABC a little bit and that sort of thing. But um, where you are, and, and also of course because you are women, um, you're d dealing with issues with people. So I um, I would like to know the question is what what do people in your ministry or in your experience find hard today uh, about the pastoral epistles, and I'm just assuming that you know something in the pastoral epistles. Look them up if you want to, um, and you can answer this question as if you're you know, asking for a friend, if you like. You know, you could it could be something that you actually find quite hard, but just oh, a friend says, you know, <laughs> this is this is hard or, or, or whatever. But but just just to get a, a feel for what are some of the issues that, that will come up that you you think will come up in the pastoral. But uh, um, yeah, so there's a lot there's a lot. So understanding. People. That's that's what you know, preaching is bringing God's word to people. So actually understanding people, understanding yourself, um, coming to know, um, to be able to critique yourself, but also to to actually you know not critique yourself too much and 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 trust your emotions as well. And all those things actually uh, need to play into this. Uh, and also to understand the the people. Um, and that's true. Um, you know, this isn't just true of preaching in women's chapel, is it? And it's another reason I want to record this. It's it's actually true for for anyone who is who is preaching, but it's particularly significant in our own day and age, and especially amongst women. Um, I, I did put, put in a little plug for Carl Truman's book called *The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self*. Um, I think it's it's just a great little historical little big. It's a great. Sorry, I read on Kindle. Um, it was a little on Kindle. Uh, every just one page, very thin. Uh, <laughs> Um, it's a great sort of uh, historical, uh, philosophical overview of the last 300 years. Helps us, it helps us, obviously it's not perfect, but it helps, he calls it a prolegomenon. It, it just helps us to get to the, um, to get a feel for where people are at. You know? so, so when this legislation in Victoria is passed um, that is, is you know, about against change and suppression of gender identity and, and sexual orientation, um, to actually, you could say, well, it's, it's ridiculous, or you could say, this is actually really bad for churches, and all those things might be right, but also to say, well, why has it happened? Uh, because this is where people are at. Some people, at least enough people, to be able to be happy that a government is putting these laws into place and not to vote them out of office when they do, probably. So um, there's enough people in our world that we want to reach who might be outside our churches and people in our churches who are affected by this. So there's, there's one example, but just to understand people uh, matters. Um, so thinking about then audience, it matters, and it really matters with the pastoral epistles, uh, because words that you say will be understood in certain ways, uh, and so you need to not, you need to be careful with your language, um, and careful with thinking, you can go overboard, you can say, you can not want to say anything whatsoever, because you might be afraid that somebody somewhere out there might take it the wrong way. Uh, that would be going too far. You need to trust in God and his sovereignty and his spirit to be at work in people's lives, that if you say something will be taken the wrong way, then there'll be opportunities at least to be able to, to talk to the person afterwards. Um, but also, you need to be actually careful and actually thinking, how will this be heard uh, as you preach? It's not just about what you say, it's about communicating to people. 
Uh, so the, the audience, um, how do we, and, and what we want to do with our audiences too, uh, the people who are hearing us, we want to both encourage them and challenge them. We want to do both of those things. Uh, and both of those things actually come together. Uh, all scriptures God breathed is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training and righteousness. You know, we want to be doing those things and we want to be doing those things with these scriptures. Indeed. Uh, that was a quote from 2 Timothy 3.16 in case you were unaware. Um, <laughs> So who are our audiences? Well, in this case, especially, that is true of any sermon really, but in this case, the preacher is the first person who needs to be encouraged and challenged. And in this case, uh, if, if you don't do that, then have you understood the text at all? It's, it's Paul's letter to who? To, not to a church, but to Timothy and Titus. Um, that is, he is speaking to the people involved in ministry. So he wants to encourage and challenge Timothy and Titus first and foremost um, at the beginning. So um, that's what you need to be doing when, you, when you're preaching and teaching, actually to, to realise that you're the first person who needs to be encouraged and challenged. Uh, and what we often do, and especially if, you, you know, especially if you're, well, you're preaching in women's chapel, you've got your peers, but anywhere where you're preaching or bringing God's word to people in any sense, you know, in, in any place, you, we will automatically feel the most pressure and challenge uh, from uh, the people around us, you know, either sort of our, our right here, our tribe here, or, um, you know, the, the idea of how will we be perceived. That's, that's automatically where we feel the pressure from. So we, that's the challenge. And so we want to get good feedback from people and make sure that it's received well. Uh, but actually, we want it to kind of get it the other way around. We want to actually encourage and challenge them. Uh, and so it's not about them feeling good about us, that we've done a good sermon. It's actually having them change. And if they're encouraged, that's great. But we also want to challenge them. Uh, so first, allow, like going back, we need to allow the text to encourage and challenge us. We've got to be the first application. Uh, the letters to individuals in ministry. So do the work of reflecting, reading, praying. Think about how does this actually apply to me? Uh, and you've got to do that in any case. But here, you know, it's just obvious that you need to do it uh, because that's who it's written to. Uh, so do, do you your readings and quiet times in the text. Um, and and I, that's what I've actually been doing just, just over the last little while, doing my quiet times in the pastorals. Um, it's, it's come up, it's actually been really helpful for me because of, of just my circumstances, but also it's been great to be able to do that in preparation for teaching. Um, but that's the second reason I'm doing it. But um, yeah, just you know, continue to be, to be encouraged. Um, and you know, the, this morning I was looking at um, uh, to Timothy, uh, and I was looking at, I'm, I'm actually up to chapter four, uh, and at this point I was reading just this morning. It just was up to Paul talking about um, the fact that he's being poured out as a drink offering. He's he's um, fought the good fight. He's run the race. Um, he's kept the faith, and there's that crown of righteousness laid up in store for him. And that was just really encouraging, just to remember. Paul had that long-term horizon. Well, actually, in his case, it was maybe short-term because he was about to die, but um, it, he had that horizon that he was pointing us towards. So just do, keep doing that. You remember, well, that's actually what this is about. It's not just about the day-to-day because, -day, uh, you know, it's not just about what we're doing tomorrow or the assignment that's coming up or, or even the, the you know, pressures that we have in other areas. Um, so after we've done that with ourselves, well, who, who are we to challenge and encourage? And I'll talk about it from the point of view of challenging. Um, two kinds of audiences we need to challenge. I think he's very broad, but at least it's good to keep both of these in mind. Firstly, the self-satisfied social conservatives. Uh, what I mean by that is that there are people who are just really happy with the way things are, happy with the way things are in church, happy with the way things are in society, or at least were you know, five years ago or whatever. Um, and the main thing that they want to do is the basic impulse that they will have is that they want to see the pastorals as confirming their current or recently past or golden age, whatever it is, society and church structures. They go, we've got a great church, uh, we've got a great society, um, I love my church, we do it right, and yeah, the pastoral epistles will cheer us on and show us how good we're doing. Um, and 
So the language and material there can be used just to confirm everything about our own society or social situation or church or whatever it is. Um, but actually the pastorals, what they do is they challenge us. They challenge our ministries. They challenge our churches in, in deep ways. Uh, so, um, and, and, and they should. And, and you know, I, I mourn, as I, I read through the entire report of um, Steve Timmis um, and what happened with Steve Timmis, if you, if you don't know what, what happened in, in the UK in the Crowded House um, in a ministry that he was involved in. And there was a report that was, it was very good um, report, it's very long, um, but they talked about all sorts of things like um, church structures, but um, like a lack of attention to certain character traits and pastoral issues. Things that just, the pastoral epistles just address. So there was all these problems that happened in this church situation that actually the pastoral speak deeply to. But, but the situation he was in, the Crowded House Church, was a evangelical, missional, kind of, you know, poster boy kind of church for lots of people. Um, and yet the pastoral epistles were not, obviously, at least they weren't, maybe they were being preached, I don't know, but they weren't necessarily being taken on board in the areas that were raised. And we need to be careful ourselves uh, in our situations. Um, and that's, that's true... Uh, you know, not just for the leaders, but for those who are calling them to account, for those who are involved in um, whatever, you know, parish councils or whatever it is, um, even on ministry teams, etc. So I just want to say that because um, I, I think the pastoral epistles are really, really key. Uh, and the key recommendation from the report, one of the key recommendations, apart from changing structures, was when you actually need to think about churches in terms of being pastoral as well as missional. And they saw that the church was very missional but not pastoral. Now, what they meant by pastoral, I don't know, but whatever they meant by it, um, the pastoral epistles certainly could have um, helped in that situation. On the other side, there's the social revolutionaries. There's um, those whose, whose kind of central worldview is filtered through the kind of revolutionary thinking, maybe the revolution of egalitarianism we've got here, Freud, Marx, whatever it is. Um, they might not even, they might realise it, they might not use those terms. Um, but those... In, in our churches and those who we're speaking to who see perhaps more clearly than, than we do and others do what is wrong in the world. And maybe it's because they've had really terrible experiences and they see it's wrong. They see sin clearly and when we'll point it out but might have that instinctive, well, well therefore, since I've pointed out sin, the only solution is revolution. So if there's a problem when it comes to gender, the answer is overturn gender. You know, if there's a problem when it comes to society or authority, the answer is overturn authority. Um, and what you want to actually do is, and there's a sort of assumption, if you don't destroy the structures um, then, and come along with me and destroy the structures, then you're not committed. You know, you're naive. You're, you're perpetuating the problem. Um, I think some of that's behind the rejection of Pauline authorship, actually, even not just now, but uh, the rejection of Paul actually writing the letters goes back centuries to kind of apocalyptic mindsets. Um, the idea of revolution and freedom, that you know, Paul was the hero of, and champion of revolution and freedom. So he couldn't have written this in the pastoral epistles because he doesn't conform to that sort of revolutionary mindset. Um, so with, with that, you actually want to affirm deeply there are things wrong in this world and there are things wrong with us. And, and the pastoral epistles point that out. There are things wrong in our church. We need to change and because we're not in heaven. Um, but at the same time, the answer is not necessarily uh, we need to overturn all the structures. Actually, the answer the pastoral epistles give is a different answer. Sometimes it does actually involve radical changes that need to happen, but not always. And what the answer of the pastoral epistles is Jesus. Jesus needs to be central. Uh, they're very strong on what's wrong in our world. Uh, they won't let us be self-satisfied. But the solution they offer is Jesus. And he is revolutionary because he brings salvation to us and he points us and he brings salvation to us in the future. So he brings salvation to us now in our, in our lives, but that's because we're looking forward to the future. Um, but what that does is it actually brings us back to affirm the goodness of relationships and the goodness actually of creation, especially in 1 Timothy, and the goodness of things like 
men and women in right order. You know, that's a good thing, but it's actually bad as well in lots of ways, but that doesn't mean... So, uh, and so it's challenging to men, uh, not just to give up their authority, but to be utterly godly in their responsibilities uh, and those kinds of things. So the pastoral epistles will do that. Um, and so we want to kind of be pointing people to Jesus and not just to go along the lines of, I'm just, I'm just preaching to sort of uphold a social conservatism, but also I'm not just preaching to sort of, you know, say, oh, well, this text doesn't understand anything and I've got a much better idea about what's going on. It's about revolution, etc. So that's kind of, um, yeah, we, we want to challenge, but we also want to encourage people. We want to encourage people. Um, we want to encourage people when they actually identify sin to actually say, yes, yeah, the pastoral epistles point out um, sin and the need for good uh, ways to deal with sin and repentance and look at all of these characteristics in here that are applied to leaders in church. Well, that is actually really important. Uh, but we also need to challenge the idea that um, this, this is how we, uh, we go about it. Um, I'm going to pause for questions in a minute um, and uh, keep going. So, um, situation matters. Uh, and, yeah, to affirm exactly what uh, Tiff was saying, uh, situation does matter, but situation is not king. So we need to think about the situation. That is the situation of the pastoral epistles themselves. But it's not necessarily a king. It doesn't change absolutely everything. So in, in many ways, the pastoral epistles, there, there is a timelessness to them. You know, there is a, there is a kind of a, this actually is really helpful for us generally. Um, the, there's the specific nature of the situation they're spoken to can be exaggerated. But they're actually not only timeless manuals for pastoral ministry. We need to realise that they're written to specific contexts and specific situations. Um, the, the, each, each of the three pastoral epistles is different, and you need to know that. You know, when you're when you're preaching it, you're not just preaching a manual for ministry. You're actually going. Paul is writing to a specific thing, and that'll help you to understand what he's doing. Not just to, to dismiss it, but to understand it. Uh, just in general, just to, to give you a bit of a general overview. Uh, One Timothy, Paul is um, writing against false teaching. And the particular false teaching, this is just gleaned from what's there in the text, emphasises words and arguments and spirituality, sort of a creation-denying spirituality, rather than this world, present day, on the ground, morality, doing what is right. You know, so, so that's what he's, he's addressing. How do I know that? I just read it. You know, <laughs> that's, that's what it says. You know. um, and you know, there's, a, there's a book on who were the, just recently released on who were the, the, the opponents and what the person does is they just go and read it and come to conclusions from it. Um, so what th there's, there's um, other issues that Paul addresses in other letters, like justification. He addresses that in, in the issue in his letter to Gal the Galatians. It doesn't really seem to be a central issue at this point um, in Ephesus. Paul's writing to Ephesus. Paul's writing to Timothy in Ephesus. So it's kind of the situation in Ephesus and its surrounds. Uh, the false teaching was interested primarily in discussion and words and arguments. It was a false teaching that promoted an interest in speculative spirituality, um, you know, speculations about big systems, creation denying asceticism, um, and it ignored or perhaps denied uh, creation affirming morality in Christian living. Or maybe it actively opposed it. Yeah, so it, it but at least it, it wasn't interested in in, in just living rightly. You know, that, that seems to be what's, what's going on here. Um, by contrast, the true teaching that counters it and which rightly arises from the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is interested deeply in moral Christian living, doing what is right. I mean, when, I say, when I say moral, I'm talking about love and gentleness and peace and um, just doing what is right as well as um, issues of sexual morality and, and those things. Um, and not simply words, discussions and arguments. Uh, it affirms the creation and it actually affirms the creational order that God has set up is good, urges people to live in the light of it. And Paul affirms that we come to salvation through living a healthy and sound life in this created order rather than escaping the created order. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of what's, what's going on. You see that in chapter 4 especially. Um, and probably chapter 2, I think. Um, so this is an application to us actually um, the false teaching was especially interested in the Old, Old Testament, but when it looked at the Old Testament, it was only looking particularly, it looks like, chapter 1, for endless genealogies and myths. So it was looking at this kind of the, the, 
the, the, the genealogies, it was looking at the, the words, really interested in arguing about the words, and less, not interested at all it seems, as Paul writes, in teaching about sin, convicting us of sin, pointing us to what God wants and his goodness for us. And I think we need to realise that is a real danger actually for us here at Moore College um, and that there's a real danger because we can kind of can do that with our biblical theology. We can end up saying, well, what is a good sermon? You know, well, it goes to the Old Testament and you do the genealogies rightly and you get to Jesus, you found Jesus, and then you have a little application at the end. You know? And sometimes that's, that's okay, but if we do that too much, actually, we can be a lot like the false teachers in 1 Timothy. Uh, because Paul's saying, no, actually, what the Old Testament teaches us to do is to convict us of sin, to realise what our sin is, and that's what the law does, and it points us to salvation in Jesus. So it's not just points us to sort of finding Jesus in there, but actually points us to salvation in Jesus, which involves repentance and faith. So there's a, there's a bit of an application for us. Um, if we spiritualise the text and don't actually say, well, how does it actually land on the ground with us and challenge us? Uh, 2 Timothy, um, the issue, the key issue in 2 Timothy is um, persecution and opposition to the ministry. Um, Paul's facing death. Uh, he probably will die soon, it seems. He's encouraging Timothy to be strong in the face of the opposition that he will face, possibly severely, both from within and without the church. Uh, so he holds fast to the gospel, the teaching, um, and that's Timothy's heritage that he's, he's received um, from, uh, from previously, ensuring others hold on to it, preparing for hardship. Uh, that is valuable for us as we face opposition, um, as Christians, to actually read the letter of, of Timothy. Um, I was just hearing today about a, a, a church um, that is not in Australia, but I was just hearing about it. It's a good church. I, I like, you know, like what the, uh, love the preacher and all sorts of things. But um, the person was talking to me about this church and was actually saying that from their perspective, what they got at church was always the same application. You know, prepare for persecution. Um, and um, what about that? You know, there was just only one or two applications about how do you prepare for persecution? Well, love each other. How do you love each other? Do life together. And she was saying, well, that's great, but we're under COVID, you know, because she was actually in, in the UK, so we actually can't do life together, so what do we do? Um, and so I'm not, you know, I, I'm sure that that minister, who's actually great in lots of ways, but, um, and may have been saying other things, and this person wasn't necessarily picking it up, but we need to be aware of that danger as well that if we do face persecution, we just want to make sure that we're not just going for one kind of application, you know, whatever that application is. Face persecution, therefore, I know what the answer is, but face persecution, therefore, um, just bear up, bear up under it or something. Face persecution, or therefore, challenge the government, or, you know, you could, you could have just one application. But Timothy has a whole lot of applications for what happens when you face persecution. There's a whole lot of things to do. And, Primarily, it's to get on with it and love people, um, but there's a whole and, and hold on to Jesus Christ and to trust Him and to look forward to Jesus' return. There's a whole lot of things in there, and so 2 Timothy is really helpful for us. Uh, Titus is um, very, very missional in lots of ways. It's the issue of how to establish ministry in a new and morally dubious situation. Crete's a hard place. Ephesus, yeah, it's got its hardships, but Crete's hard. You know, you read it, yeah, that's that's hard. It's a new ministry being established. Um, obviously worthwhile to do, but Titus is finding it tough. The gospel is for all, and that's big in, in Titus, um, and it needs to be preached to all, even the people who are hard, but it's going to be tough. Um, Paul in Titus, that's where he does emphasize, emphasize justification by faith, alongside right living. He, I think he gives possibly a fuller outline of the gospel in Titus, because that's what you need in the new church. You need a full outline of the gospel in, in the issue, of, you know, there's more specific issues going on in Ephesus. Uh, so actually Titus is really encouraging about what to do in new or hard situations of ministry where the environment, the people, whatever it is, are actually just really tough. So there's, there's Titus. Um, and note that there's differences between them. So know what book you're preaching. You're not just preaching the pastoral epistles. You're actually preaching Titus or two things, one thing. Uh, but at the same time, don't let your view of the situation override the text. Uh, the situation needs to arise from the text, not just be imposed on the text. And so um, historical reconstructions of a possible situation that could possibly be the case, but then becomes the actual key that you use to preach the text. Be aware of that kind of thing. And there are all sorts of things like that going around. 
Um, so, you know, uh, and, and 1 Timothy 2 is, is an example of it. You know, you, you want to be able to, um, uh, to, to not say, well, you know, and I did hear someone at one point saying, well, um, in the situation of the church, you see that there's false teaching and you also see that there are women and so maybe some of the women were doing the false teaching, even though it never actually says it. But maybe they were. Oh, it's, it's possible that they were. And if they were, then maybe that's what's going on in 1 Timothy 2, because if the women were doing the false teaching, then maybe Timothy is saying to the women, don't do the false teaching. So the application is, don't do false teaching if you're women. Yeah. And you go, OK, but there's a lot of, and that's a long bow, because there's just a whole lot of assumptions in there, and each step is not really fully based on what you're drawing out of the text. Uh, or, you know, or maybe it is, you can show it, perhaps. But um, that kind of application. And then, then the, the application was um, teach. Because once you've learned the true gospel, then, then women should teach. And you go, okay, maybe that's an application you could draw from something, but that's not what Paul says here. So you just be careful of those kinds of let's draw, let's, you know, uh, um, especially if it's based on a, a bit of a house of cards. Okay? You need to be looking at what the situation is explicitly. Now, of course, if there's good reasons, then there could be good reasons, but that's, that's something to watch out for. Yep. Um, so here are, my, here are my, my, my more general tips. I've said, okay, here's the specific things to look at. Firstly, uh, my tips are always remember Jesus Christ. Now, Paul says, remember Jesus Christ. So I'm telling you, always remember Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus Christ every time, <laughs> not just in that passage. Um, and it's actually not that hard because the letters are full of references to Jesus Christ. And they're there in key places. Paul is talking about Jesus. But he's, talking, he's, he's not talking about Jesus in the abstract. He's talking about Jesus Christ in order to show how do we live and minister the gospel. So all the references to Jesus Christ are there deliberately and are, are, are applicable. Um, so he's, the, he's the reason for the behaviour, he's the reason for the ministry, he's the reason uh, f and, and the way in which we um, are able to, to bear up under persecution. Uh, so we can, because it's actually really practical in lots of ways, it, it, you know, it, it says do this, do that, etc. You can be tempted towards moralism, where you forget Jesus is in the text and you just tell people what to do, or you just assume that everybody knows that Jesus is there, now let's just tell people what to do. Um, and if you do that, then you'll actually burden people with a moralistic idea of doing right to make God happy with them. You know, the, you, you move away from justification, which certainly Titus um, doesn't uh, want you to do, and, and Paul doesn't do that either in either of the letters. Um, and it turns Christianity into a little... It, you can be in danger of just turning Christianity into a, a kind of a middle-class morality that just affirms what everyone wants it to affirm, because you're forgetting Jesus Christ, and, and he's the revolutionary in this... Uh, in this whole thing. Um, and, and then you can create the equal and opposite reaction. That is because if you just make it into morality without Jesus Christ, then actually, well, th there's the equal and opposite reaction that um, the text, people will say, well, if this is just a moral text, this, this kind of morality causes harm. And it, it kind of does if it's not actually linked to Jesus Christ. You know, if it's just, you're just preaching morality, then it actually, you know, people say, well, this just causes harm. Um, and then we'll react against the text and we'll just reject the text on that basis or reject, reject what you're saying. It all happens when we forget Jesus. So always ask the question, here's the question, how and why is Jesus Christ the reason here? Not just where is Jesus in the text, that's true, but he's pretty obviously there. Why is he the reason and how is he the reason for what Paul is saying? So um, uh, Christology uh, is, is important. Um, so there's an article by Towner that um, third years have got recommended reading. Um, Towner's really good there. Um, so to ask questions like, who is Jesus? That is, what is Paul saying about Jesus and who he is? What has he done? And how does that affect what Paul says about Christian life and ministry? Uh, very broadly, actually the emphasis about on Jesus is different in the different letters because of the different um, emphases and situations. So all the letters talk about Jesus coming, dying on the cross for our sins, coming again, uh, rising from the dead and coming again. Okay, that's, that's all there in all the letters. But in 1 Timothy, there is a specific and particular emphasis on Jesus' humanity, his incarnation, and his present authority over our lives uh, and over the lives of all, crea over all creation and all people um, in 1 Timothy 2. 
Um, so it's emphasised that he is the man. He is the mediator between God and man. The man, Jesus Christ. And so that's, that's important because of what Paul is saying about God's created order. Um, and it's, it's, we, we don't escape it. Self, salvation comes through living in it. And so the only, well not the only, but one of the key ways to understand why that's important um, is to look at Jesus and who he is. He's not, just, he's not just a spirit being up there. We're not just trying to get to this spiritual plane where Jesus is up there through our asceticism, etc. No, Jesus is actually our mediator between God and humanity and us here in our current situation that we're living in with all its hardships and all of its ups and downs. Jesus is, is here, he's, he's, he's incarnate, so we live in that light. To Timothy, on the other hand, the emphasis is on Jesus' vindication, his power, his future appearing when he will come to vindicate those who are faithful. Uh, and that's important. Um, it's also, um, uh, there's also an, an emphasis on um, Jesus as doing those other things, but that's particularly important. And that's, of course, because Timothy needs the encouragement as he faces opposition and difficulty to be able to say, look, Jesus is in charge here and he will vindicate us. Um, so there's a real emphasis there. That's not the only thing, but that's there. Titus is, is a bit broader. Uh, again, like it's a new ministry, needs a fuller understanding of Jesus. So actually Titus emphasises Jesus is both divine and human. So both of those kind of are quite sort of equally emphasised. And um, grace, there's quite a broad understanding of grace, justification and right living and how they both go together. And again, that makes sense in a new church situation in a difficult, hard circumstances. You need to preach grace. You need to see justification by faith is really important. You also need to see how that actually works out in people's lives. Both of those things uh, together. Uh, so there's, there's, uh, uh, there's that. Um, remember Jesus Christ. Another point per is don't be lazy in your application. Um, there's three mistakes in application you can make when you're lazy. Uh, and we, you know, I know, I know that actually we're in a kind of a situation where um, it's really easy to be tempted to be lazy in application. And that's partly because of what we do to you and what we reward. We give you marks for exegesis, you know, actual tangible numbers that, that, that you can stick on a piece of paper and say, I've got that mark for my exegesis. But we don't do that for your application. You know, you'll get feedback, but you know, so there's a kind of a bit of a skewing. So you, you can be tempted to be lazy in your application. Um, First mistake, if you're lazy, is you can apply every word as if our situation is exactly the same as the original hearers. So, okay, um, and it kind of can be easy to do because there's a lot of similarities between our situation and the original hearers, but not exactly the same. So elaborate hairstyles, okay? So you don't want to, you don't want to sort of just, without understanding what elaborate hairstyles meant in the ancient world, you don't want to just preach against you know, an 80s hairstyle or something, you know, like um, I saw the Terminator last week with our kids and that amazing hairstyle. It was... Anyway, the, the, you don't want to preach against that, okay? Or just, just against that. Um, that's not what Paul's saying. Our elaborate hairstyles meant something. Uh, they had to do a, a, a sign of rebellion, permissiveness, all sorts of things. So actually understanding that actually really helps you to say, what, what, what do we need to do to avoid what Paul is actually speaking against today? rather than just lazily talking about elaborate hairstyles and, and that kind of thing. Um, other principles, like the widow's list, you know, and I know this sounds obvious, but, you know, there's a 60-year-old cutoff. So are we going to say that, okay, um, we only look after widows who are 60 years old or under and, and anyone who's 59 has to get married, you know, uh, because that would be a straightforward, lazy application of the text. But no, that's not, it's a, it's a principle looking after those who are vulnerable. Principles of... Um, Making, uh, making sure that we're caring for those who are vulnerable, honouring those who are older, being careful not to set up a situation where caring becomes an excuse for ungodliness, not setting up a situation where we actually uh, create problems because of our over-loving of people or loving people in the wrong way, where we actually allow them into, into ungodliness. Those kinds of things come out of that text, uh, quest those kinds of questions. So Paul, yes, he's, he's talking specifically about younger widows and, and, and marriage and everything else. Uh, but he's actually talking also, and, and also more broadly, about setting up these kinds of situations of looking after people, but not looking after people in such a way that you're going to have problems. So um, there's, there's more to it. You, know, you need to do the work. Uh, but there's just one example um, of that. Uh, and of course, there is application to, um, to marriage and, there, and that kind of thing. But you need to, to work out what Paul's talking about and the point that he's making. 
Um, the second mistake you can make is make everything a matter of abstract principle so that none of the details apply to us. Uh, so, you know, we, we can say, well, this, this is just, you know, whatever happens, you know, the word, the word teach in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12 just doesn't happen today, so it just doesn't apply. You know, thanks for the sermon, you know. <laughs> that's, um, but that's, um, uh, but it's actually the key word in 1 Timothy 2, verse 12. It often, often gets sidelined um, as if it's just an example of a broader principle. But here, it kind of is the principle, you know, that, that Paul's talking about. And you look at the text. Elaborate hairstyles are a specific example of a broader principle in the text. But teach is kind of the principle of which there are specific outworkings. <laughs> so, so doing that with the text, but then, then working on the, on the application. Um, a third mistake, and this is, this is a, a really important one um, and something that, that I think really matters. Neglect thinking hard about applying the text to specific situations of the people in your audience. Um, because the pastorals are actually so, so relevant you need to think about it, you need to do it, but they are so relevant. They talk about church life. They talk about the Christian life. And if you teach on the pastorals without direct application and challenge, it can sort of be worse than doing nothing at all because you've just taken a text that sort of obviously speaks to our situation and it's got obvious relevance and then you actually don't apply it to us. Uh, that's What's that saying? That's saying, well, here's an interesting text rather than this really matters for our lives. A little bit like the flu vaccine. I don't think it's the same as the COVID-19 vaccine. I haven't understood the COVID-19 vaccine. But the flu vaccine, um, someone explained it to me. I think this is right. Um, that the flu vaccine, what it does is you, you inject it uh, and it's got a piece of, it's got, it's got sort of, you know, examples of the flu in it, but they're all dead. Um, and so your immune system can go and it can look at these examples of the flu. It doesn't affect you. Um, and they can look at it and they can learn, okay, any time I see the flu, the real live example, I know how to deal with it. And you don't want to inoculate your hearers by preaching sermons that give them this sort of form of godliness but deny its power. Okay, see what I did there? I just used a phrase, okay. So just sort of go, okay, here is, here is, here is, um, and, and I, I have heard it, a sermon on 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 19 to 22 um, that, was, that was given. It was about what to do with a charge against an elder and what to do uh, about being careful about appointing elders. And the person just walked us through the text and said, this is what the text says. And we didn't talk about, well, what about the obvious issues about better, better accountability structures that we need in our churches? What about the obvious issues of just failures of leadership and of, of eldership that have actually just happened that I'm thinking about and that everybody's thinking about right now because, you know, it's, well, a lot of people are thinking about it. What about the, the, the people who are sitting there going, yeah, well, what happened when that church broke down or that church broke down or with that situation I'm from? Uh, no, no, no reference to it. Um, just here you go, you've got the text and you go, um, this is actually a perfect time if you're preaching on that text to, for example, talk about your church's grievance policy. So Paul is saying you need to uh, not admit a charge against an elder lightly, make sure that you do it properly, two or three witnesses, that's the principle. Um, so what is your church doing about it? And to actually to, to mention it um, if you, in, in inappropriate ways. You know, it depends on where you're, where you're at or, or whatever, but to, but to know, and to bring it to people's attention. So look, if you are having a problem with one of our elders, here's what you do about it. Here's our structure that we have set up in obedience to 1 Timothy. And we take it seriously. Um, those kinds of things. Now, that's just one example, but, but um, uh, apply it. You know, here's the website. Go, 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 go to it. And you might think, well, that's taking valuable time from God's word. But it's not, because that's what God's word is saying right here, right now. This is how we actually apply it, and this is how we are applying it as a church. Um, it's like, an, don't ignore the elephant in the room, uh, but also think hard about um, the other passages as well. Um, and apologetics. I think this is my last point. Yes, it is. Um, just keep remembering, apologetics is your servant, not your goal. Uh, so because of all these issues that we've, we've identified here, issues that come up for us in all different situations, kids, women's conferences, union ministry, evangelism, uh, we've got issues that we're struggling with, that people are struggling with, Paul the misogynist, um, all those kinds of uh, issues that come up, domestic violence, really important issues. Um, we can be tempted to have apologetics as our goal. 
So you could, you could actually think, okay, the goal of my sermon is to show people that Paul is not quite as bad as they thought he was. Um, and if I've done that, I, okay, you might actually have to do that. That could be something that you actually do need to do. You actually need to bring people in and say, look, there's, there's all these ideas about Paul going around, but look at actually what Paul actually does say here when he doesn't say it here. Yeah, there's, there's issues we need to struggle with, but here are some things he says. Um, the, the, yes, you don't need to do that, but it's, it's not there as your final goal in your teaching. It's there as a goal to clear away blockages so people will listen to what the text actually says. So what is Paul saying? Um, if Paul, if, if, I can, if I can't get past the fact that Paul's a misogynist, so I'm just not going to listen to him at all whatsoever, then you do need to deal with it. But you're not dealing with it just to show that Paul's okay. You're dealing with it in order to help people to listen to what Paul has to say and therefore what God has to say. So that's your, that's your goal. Um, so it's a, but it's a good servant. Apologetics is a good servant to clear away blockages, uh, to challenge people's preconceptions and our own preconceptions and to say, look, here is the world that we are living in, uh, to, to, to actually challenge the world that we're living in, but also to say, actually, you know, do, do, you, do you know that one, one of the, sorry, well, this is one of the problems of, of apologetics, that we can end up trying to prove to people that the church isn't so bad, okay? But one Timothy keeps saying that the church kind of is bad, yeah. and 2 Timothy does as well. Uh, th I mean, you know, not, not the most terrible thing in the world, but you know, the Spirit expressly says that in later times, you know, there'll be false prophets and they'll deceive and it'll be actually quite terrible. So you don't want to be so apologetic that you're saying actually the church is just actually really, really wonderful. You actually want to say, no, but God's word challenges us to actually live rightly because we live in this world of sin and we need to be careful about that. So, um, and apologetics can do that, uh, in, in that it can help you to actually grapple with the kind of things that are going on in our world and to actually deal with the, the abuse and, and other things that are happening um, in a way that isn't just writing it off, but also saying, yeah, but the answer is actually not to say that the church is great, but to say that Jesus is great and that Jesus is who we need to keep coming back to. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's, there's, um, there's my thoughts there. Okay, so I think that's all I sort of, I just had a list of things I thought might be helpful to say that you might have, you know, thought that there were other things to say, that's fine as well, there's probably a whole lot of other things. Um, but there's just some principles, some helpful things. I haven't gone directly into the text or the exegesis. Uh, we've got time for questions. If uh, you want to ask further questions. I would just like to refer to that. Okay, um, the th so what I did was I said, just the questions is, who is Jesus being presented as here? What has he done? And how does it affect what Paul says about Christian life and ministry? Um, and then I looked at the specific letters uh, and uh, I mean my main, my main challenge is just to to do that, to ask that question yourself because it's a question you can't ask yourself but I gave examples from 1 Timothy so for example, the emphasis on Jesus' humanity yeah, yeah, yeah it is, it is I mean that's just, a, it's, a, it's a broad question that doesn't just apply to the, the pastoral epistles does it, how do, how do we make sure that we're not um, their, their application is pointed but isn't kind of, you know, too one-sided. Um, there's a number of answers I've got to that. The first answer is that actually sometimes you just need to pick one and go with it. Uh, because if you just try to be balanced all the time, then you just end up having a very balanced sermon that doesn't affect anybody. Uh, because, as, you know, as soon as you... As soon as you, We will listen to the application that doesn't apply to us. Uh, and so <laughs> that's just what we do. So if you have two applications and one applies to this group, and one applies to this group, then that group will listen to this one, and that group will listen to that one. Uh, and that's just what will happen. Um, that's the number one, so as soon as you have to pick one and go with it. But if you're gonna do that, then over time, I'm hoping that most of the time, in women's chapel, um, you are, um, I, mean, I, I, guess, I guess each of you is just gonna be preaching one sermon, so it's hard for you to, to choose. But if you're actually finding over the entire year that actually there's only one side you're ever coming down on, you might want to think, well, we've done enough of that. Now, now we, we need to, to look at this kind of application. Um, and that'll be true in ministry. You know, preaching is about pastoring, sharing a flock, being with people. So if you're with people, you actually will want to be thinking, okay, well, they need to hear this now. Uh, this is what they need to hear. Or 
most, most of them actually need to hear this right now, which is coming out of the text. And there's something else that's coming out of the text that maybe these people over here need to hear, but actually I need to address most of them. But I, I probably need to go and have a chat to those people as well. Or you could just say, look, um, this text actually says something really important to you social conservatives, right? Um, you know, don't use that phrase, I don't know, but they're, they're like, however it works. You people who think, even you people, it's, uh, that's terrible, isn't it? Well, uh, anyway, yeah, um, there, there might be people here <laughs> who, who actually really love what Paul says here about authority, you know? Um, and if, if, that's, if that's you, really love, you actually need to realise that he also actually challenges what our view of authority is. It's about gentleness and love, okay? And you need to realise that, but, but actually, probably most of us here today, actually live in a, a situation, and I know you guys, actually we're anti-authoritarian. Anti so we actually need to hear what Paul has to pay, say about authority here. That, that's an example of, of, of doing it. Yeah. And that's just not, not just the pastoral um, some, some people, because we think we're dealing with Paul, we think, Paul, and, and we really are highly affected by Luther, who obviously is a great, great person in, in many ways, you know, but he was really into Galatians. So we kind of go, how does the false teaching here in Ephesus relate to Paul's issue in Galatians? But it, it doesn't as much. You know, it's there, and you see you know, Galatians chapter 5. But um, the issue is not so much what they were doing with justification. The issue is kind of what they were doing with sanctification, if you want to put it that way. Uh, and, it's, and it's not just that they were not b doing sanctification. It's, just, it's not that they were not trying to be sanctified. It's that they were looking for their sanctification in um, asceticism, escape from the world, and that a lot of the time they weren't interested in sanctification, they were just interested in arguments. Yeah. So there, there's, a, there's a broad, broad brush stroke. But it's just, that's just coming from what Paul says. You know? yeah. Realising, of course, that Paul is being polemical, so the false teachers probably wouldn't have described themselves as teaching the teaching of demons, for example. Yeah. Uh, so it's not it's not a, a word for word description of their own script. It's it's his view of it. Yeah. Well, can you say a little bit more about um, I guess the hermeneutic or the application when it's um, us as women teaching if the idea in one Timothy seems to be eldership being male. Mm, yeah. Um, Yes. And therefore, he's kind of talking to that, a male leader. Yes. Um, where women speaking to women only. Yes. So if you have, if you have, do you have any insights there or just wisdom? Yeah, that's right. Um, so uh, Paul, Paul is speaking to those who have a position of authority in the church. The kinds of things he says in 1 Timothy and Titus about that, actually 2 Timothy too, are not kind of job descriptions um, and even able to teach, you know, seems to have a strong moral element to it, but they're actually character, character traits. Mm -hmm. So the kind of things that he applies to the specific situations, we're talking about male elders and deacons, and also either wives or deaconesses, um, whatever that is, um, apply. You know, they, they, they're, they're not too... Um, they actually are traits that all Christians should have, in fact, uh, but especially those who have a position of authority teaching in any sense, and therefore they're strongly applicable to um, the the males now uh, to, to the to the male elders, but also they're applicable mostly uh, to uh, to women. Some of them um, are kind of you need you need to think a little bit about it. So you know manages his own household well. Um, so what does that what does that mean? What if you you know what is your household? Especially you know, like if you're single, what's what's a household? You know what, what does that mean? Um, well, you've got a household. You know it's just not necessarily it's not a nuclear household, but these weren't nuclear households either. You know so, um, but you know how how do you relate to people around you? Uh, and actually, the management of of, of the household um, is is something that women are actually told to do. So uh, it's it's quite interesting that one of the qualifications for elders is that he does what. Um, the, the, the women are told to do as well, <laughs> yeah, and does it well. Um, yeah, there's there's my general thoughts about that as you read it through. But it's not it's not too hard. But you do have to do some work to do it. Yeah, yeah. and that comes doesn't it to the universal kind of direct application. You don't want to make it too direct, 
You don't want to make it too universal, but it can be. You've been listening to ISOChat's Theology. I'm Lionel Windsor, New Testament lecturer at Moore Theological College, Sydney. You might also like to check out another podcast I've created called Lift Your Eyes, a series of 70 reflections on Ephesians. Thanks for listening.